The Carnegie Mellon Quarantine Database Talks are made possible by the Stephen Moy Foundation for Keeping It Real and by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to another Quarantine Database Talk. It's a beautiful day in Pittsburgh. Becca is in uh, Chicago. It's also a beautiful day there, uh, but it's still a pandemic, so we're stuck inside. Um, so today we're excited to have Dr. Rebecca Taft from Carthage DB, who is the, uh, what is your official title, lead architect? Uh, no, just mem member of technical staff, I think is. An awesome person at Carthage <laughs> DB. Uh, uh, Becca did her PhD with Mike Snowbreaker at MIT. Uh, she worked with me on some HR projects as well. Um, so again, the way we want to do this is if you have any questions for Becca, please just unmute yourself, say who you are and ask your question. And as always, we want to thank the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real for sponsoring this event. Okay. All right, Becca, the floor is yours. Go for it. Cool. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much, Andy, for hosting me and thanks everyone for joining. So um, as Andy said, I'll, I'll be telling you about CockroachDB's query optimizer. So for those of you not familiar with CockroachDB, uh, it's a database that's designed with the mission to make data easy. Um, as the name Cockroach implies, it's resilient to disasters. Um, so it's meant to survive uh, up to you know, even a whole data center or, or regional outage. It's also scalable, so it'll scale out as an application grows or, or scale up. Uh, it's geo-distributed capabilities, um, enable data to reside close to the users that are actually accessing it most frequently. Uh, support for SQL and um, serializable isolation makes uh, development of OLTP applications simpler, and it's also open source. Just to give you guys a sense of how uh, customers are using CockroachDB, this is actually a real CockroachDB deployment of a company that has markets in Europe, Australia, and the US. And as you can see, uh, by locating the nodes in each of those regions, they enable their customers to have low latency access to their data. Um, also, by storing everything in a single database, they make it simpler on their application developers because uh, they don't have to worry about any manual sharding. The database just takes care of all of that uh, and provides strong transactional guarantees. Uh, and, and finally, you can see it's extremely resilient because they can you know, even lose an entire region and the application will be able to continue running. So in order to support these types of workloads, CockroachDB uh, is a shared, has a shared nothing architecture. And it consists of a distributed SQL layer on top of a distributed key value store. So in this talk today, I'm basically going to be focusing entirely on the SQL layer. But uh, the KV layer is also really interesting. So I encourage you to um, you know, stick around at the end. If there's time, we can, we can talk about that. Or check out, there's lots of info online. We have a Sigmod paper we recently published that goes into lots of detail about the, the um, key value layer. There's also blogs and videos online. Um, but anyway, as you can see, for the, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be focusing mostly on query optimization. So before I move on, are there any questions? I think go for it. You're good. All right. The chat questions were me, sorry. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah I, I, can't see, I can't see the chat questions. So yeah, feel free that's, to that's on my fault. Go for it. Feel free to jump in. Um, OK, so yeah, so query optimization in, in CockroachDB. Um, since we support SQL, we need some way uh, in order to convert that declarative SQL statement into a query plan that the database knows how to execute to return the results to the user. Um, so you know, this could be an optimizer or kind of a more basic planner. But you might ask, there's plenty of open source optimizers out there, like Postgres, for example. CockroachDB speaks the uh, Postgres wire protocol or the Postgres dialect of SQL. Um, so it, you know, it's not a crazy idea to use the Postgres optimizer. But there's a few reasons we decided not to do that. Um, first of all, CockroachDB is written in Go, and Postgres is in C. So there's some amount of overhead uh, when translating between those two that we wanted to avoid. Uh, second of all, the execution plans are going to be very different. Postgres is a single node system. And as you saw, a CockroachDB database can span you know, potentially thousands of miles. So a plan that might perform very well on a single node may perform very poorly when distributed um, across a large distance. And then finally, as you probably know, um, the, the difference in performance between the best plan and the worst plan that an optimizer can choose can be orders of magnitude. Um, so this is a, a crucial component um, in terms of performance for a database. So as a database vendor, we wanted to have control over this piece of the, of the system. All right, so, so CockroachDB's first optimizer was not really an optimizer. It was more of a heuristic planner. It used rules to choose the execution plan. 
And these rules might look something like this. Uh, if an index is available on the attribute of a filter condition, always use it. Uh, but the problem is it's hard to write rules that are going to be universally good. And as CockroachDB was used for more and more different types of use cases, these rules got more and more complicated, and over time started to look more like this. Always use the index, except when the table is very small, or we expect to scan more than 75% of the rows, or the index is located on a remote machine. So as you can see, uh, you know, this is getting kind of unwieldy, difficult to manage, it's very brittle, and it kind of works for OLTP queries, you know, simple CRUD queries where you're just uh, reading or updating a small number of rows. But the problem is that our customers actually will run everything. They'll, you know, run all different kinds of workloads, both OL2P and OLAP, when comparing us against our competitors, when deciding which database to use. And then even in production, they might actually run some olap -y style queries, say, at the end of the day for kind of an end-of-day reporting, um, that kind of thing. So, you know, we wanted to make sure that our performance didn't suck when running uh, more olap style queries. So by the time I joined the company about three years ago, the decision had already been made that the heuristic planner had outlived its usefulness, and it was time to build a real cost-based optimizer. So an optimizer, basically, instead of applying rigid rules, it considers multiple alternatives. It assigns a cost to each alternative, where the cost is, is kind of a unitless value that basically allows you to uh, compare different alternatives, uh, sort of compare the relative cost of, of each of these alternatives. Um, and then we choose the lowest cost option. Um, and those of you who are actually familiar with um, query optimization, this is a, we decided to implement a cascade style optimizer with unified search. So if you're not familiar with that, not to worry, I'm gonna uh, give a lot more details in a second. So how do we actually generate these alternatives? We start with a default plan that can be kind of mechanically constructed from the SQL query. And we perform a series of transformations, which basically transform the query plan from uh, one, uh, plan to a logically equivalent plan. And then we store all of those alternatives in a compact data structure called a memo. So if you've taken Andy's class or you're familiar with optimization, you already know what a memo is. But um, if not, the only thing you need to take from the slide is that we have a way of generating these alternatives and drawing them efficiently. Um, and then, you know, how do we assign a cost to these alternative plans? Well, there's a few factors that affect the cost. Uh, the hardware configuration, like, uh, you know, which disk, which type of disk you're using, um, where are the nodes located, how is the data distributed across those nodes, what type of operators are in the plan, like, you know, select versus join versus scan, and then the number of rows processed by each operator. So I'm going to talk about all of this in detail. Um, any questions before we move on? So for the cost model quickly, uh, like, yeah. do you do anything like the Postgres does where like they have like the initial cost was like a cheap approximation and then there's like a final cost that like if, if you decide, okay, let me compute the rest of it. Or is it like a, a single cost model that produces a single value? Yeah, we just have a single value right now. Um, okay. There's you know plenty of improvements that we want to make at some point, but for now okay. it's a single value. And then I, I don't want to get too deep in the Cascades wonkiness, but like, do you do, um, can you do uh, cost model estimations on logical nodes, or does it always have to be the physical node? Um, so we kind of m merge the idea of logical and physical. So for example, you know, we don't really have a concept of a logical join. A logical join is basically a hash join for us. We kind of default to hash join. Okay. Uh, so you know, we assign a cost to everything. Super interesting, keep going, this is awesome. Cool. All right, so how do we generate these alternatives? Um, this is kind of the uh, flow of how uh, we generate the alternatives in, in the optimizer. So I'm gonna talk about each of these in detail. And for this section of the talk, I'll be working with this sample query you see here. So we have two tables, A, B, and C, D. A and C are the, uh, the primary keys, and then we have a secondary index on column B. And we'll be optimizing this query, select star from A, B, join C, D on B equals C, where B is greater than one. All right, so uh, start off, we have parsing. And I'm not really gonna talk too much about parsing because this is pretty much the same across most databases. We um, have a, a YAC file that's very similar to the Postgres YAC file, more the grammar stored. Um, so basically the parser takes the SQL string as input and outputs an abstract syntax tree, like you see here. Here I'm actually showing the specific Go structs that, that are produced as part of the parsing phase. Um, 
Next, we have op builder, and the op builder takes this abstract syntax tree from the parser, and its job is to call a bunch of nested functions like you see here, and these functions will produce the preliminary query plan. Um, it also performs semantic analysis as part, as part of this process. Uh, so this is where we kind of check that the query makes logical sense. So even if it passed the parser, so it's grammatically correct in a way, uh, it may not be logically correct. Like these English sentences you see here are grammatically correct, but they, they really make no sense at all. Uh, so in the context of SQL, in, in a context of our specific query, we'll be checking things like, are A, B, and C, D real tables in the database that the current user has permission to read? Do columns B and C exist in tables A, B, and C, D, and are they unique? Um, and, and do their types match so that we can actually perform this uh, equality comparison? And what columns are selected by star? Uh, all right, moving on to normalization. Um, for, semantic, quick, for semantic analysis, like, yeah. do you do, at what point do you try to like bind a, uh, like if it's, if, it, if it's a prepared statement, at what mm -hmm. point do you try to bind the prepared statement value to a type? Um, the prepared statement value, that happens, yeah, during the op builder phase. We do kind of all the type checking during, okay. during that phase as well. Okay, awesome, thanks. Yeah, so, so normalization is actually happening kind of in parallel with the previous phase, the op builder phase. And that's because these um, function calls that I showed you before, the, these nested function calls, are actually uh, factory methods that have been code generated from a number of normalization rules that we've defined. Uh, so basically what happens is the, the op builder thinks it's constructing kind of the, the canonical plan from, from the SQL query. So in our, in our example query, we have the op builder um, thinking that it's constructing this inner hash join wrapped in a select with filters b greater than one followed by a project. Uh, but what it's actually constructing is this plan on the right, um, you can see here, and that's because each of these uh, functions, these, these factory functions, um, have a bunch of normalization rules that, that will fire in, in the process of being called. Um, so what has happened here, you can see, is that we've basically used the uh, fact that b equals c in order to infer that if b is greater than 1, then c is also greater than 1. And then we've pushed those filters down below the join onto whichever side uh, is appropriate. So maybe this looks a little bit like magic right now, but um, let's talk more about how it works. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention is that these factory functions are extremely efficient, so we don't actually even materialize this first plan that the op builder thinks it's constructing. We only end up materializing the fully normalized plan. All right, so normalization rules uh, are transformation rules. They're kind of one of two types. We have normalization and exploration, which I'll talk about a little later. And all of these rules create a logically equivalent relational expression um, to the one that they started from. Normalization rules specifically are kind of always a good idea to apply. So we don't even bother keeping around the old expression because it's generally going to be strictly worse than the new one. Uh, so for that reason, a lot of databases will call this phase the rewrite phase. Um, and we actually have hundreds of normalization rules, but I'm showing a few examples here. For example, we uh, eliminate unnecessary operations. So obviously not not x is going to be the same as x. It's going to be more efficient to execute. Um, we, know we don't have to execute not not x for each row. Uh, canonicalizing expressions, we, you know, x equals 5 is not actually going to be more efficient than 5 equals x, but it's helpful to perform this canonicalization so that other rules don't have to check both ways. They can basically just match having a, a variable on the left-hand side. Constant folding is another important one that you've probably heard of. Um, basically allows us to avoid executing the same function over and over again um, for each row during execution, and it also enables us to uh, fire other optimization rules later on, like, for example, um, uh, constraining an index. Uh, and then these last two items, uh, predicate pushdown and decorrelation subqueries, are not always a good idea. I have, you know, this little asterisk saying, you know, they, they don't completely fulfill the normal normalization rules. Uh, but it's just easier to kind of treat them this way because there's very few cases where they're, they're not going to be a good idea. Those of you not familiar, predicate pushdown basically means we want to push the filters as far down the query plan tree as possible in order to limit the number of rows processed by parent operators. And decorrelation of subqueries is 
if you have a subquery that refers to the outer query, we want to try to hoist that up into a join or some other type of operation that's going to be more efficient to execute. So what do these rules look like in your code? Are they just, is it, they look like patterns are matching the same way you, in the cascades as you go down, or is this sort of some kind of separate syntax? Yeah, great question. So that is my next slide. Um, awesome. So we have this um, domain-specific language called opgen, which is how we represent all of the, the um, transformation rules, both normalization and exploration. And uh, even though uh, this rule I'm showing here is very simple, this is, this is the kind of the simplification of two nested knots into just the input of the, of the knot. Um, all of the rules basically have the same format. So we have a comment at the top saying what the rule does. Then we have a header with the rule name and any tags that apply to the rule. This basically signifies that this is a normalization rule. Then we have the match pattern, which um, here basically any expression that has two nested knot operations will match. The uh, input, this is where the, the input variable is bound to the input of the knot. And then finally, the, the replace expression below the arrow is when we, we actually return the input. And this gets compiled into Go, uh, which you can see here. This is um, actually kind of a simplified version of, of this rule. It's a little bit more complex. But uh, we have this factory function construct not. You might recognize this from the uh, type of functions that the op builder was calling earlier. And inside this function, we have all of the rules that apply to the not expression. So this eliminate not rule basically says if there's a nested not when we're trying to construct a not, uh, we will just uh, take the input and return it. Um, if we actually get through this entire function and none of the rules match, so we don't return early, then at the end of the function, we, put, we memoize not, we put the not expression in the memo, and we return it. And again, I'm going to talk about the memo in a little bit, but remember that is a data structure that stores our query plans. This is another option rule, merge selects, another normalization rule. And the reason I'm showing you uh, this rule is because it shows one other feature of option, which is the ability to call uh, arbitrary Go code. So this rule is taking two nested select operations and concatenating their filters. So this um, concat filters function, if we actually look at the generated code, is just an, another function defined elsewhere. Uh, so this allows us to basically call arbitrary Go code from um, the opgen rules, which, you know, obviously there's some very specific syntax with opgen that is going to be uh, useful in general, but we can also call custom functions as well. All right, any questions on normalization before I move on? I know that was kind of a lot. I mean, I, I have so many questions. So how much is the, the that DSL, like how Go specific is it? Like, like, like are there idioms of Go that would prevent us from cogening to like C++, for example? Or like, like, like yes, there's the function called to arbitrary Go code, but you could implement that in C++ and that, that would then compile. Yeah. I I think it would work potentially with other languages. I mean, you'd have to obviously rewrite the compiler, but um, yeah, yeah. but yeah, I, I think the syntax would work. I mean, we don't we don't take advantage of things like you know the multiple return values of Go or anything like that. We, sure. we haven't um, we, we haven't done that. Um, yeah, well, well, I'll think about that. I, I can't think of well, anything. No, we'll like throw a student now. We'll see what happens. Yeah, <laughs> sounds good. All right. Um, all right. So exploration. Expiration is the other type of rules. These are um, rules that may or may not produce a better plan. So unlike with normalization, where we just replace the previous plan, with expiration, we're going we're to keep uh, both alternatives around. So these are things like join reordering, um, selecting a specific join algorithm, hash join, merge join, and lookup join. Um, lookup join, by the way, is sometimes called index nested loops join in other databases. I know that might confuse some people. Uh, an index selection is, is another one that is an exploration rule. So um, this, these rules use the exact same option syntax as the normalization rules. They just have that explore tag instead of normalize. All right, so I can't really go any further without actually describing the memo at this point. Remember, this is, this is the data structure that stores uh, our forest of query plan trees. And the memo looks like you see here, it uh, consists of a series of groups 
Here I'm just showing the relational expressions. Each group is a, is a different relational expression, join, select, scan. Um, in reality, we also store the scalar expressions in memo groups, but I'm omitting them here just to, for simplicity. And this is showing the memo as it looks after normalization is complete. So you can see it matches this plan on the right with our, um, our hash join and the, the two filters pushed down. Uh, there's gonna be one expression for each group um, at the end of normalization. As we, as we explore, we're gonna add more expressions to each group. And each of the expressions in a single group are logically equivalent. Another thing to note about the memo is that groups can refer to other groups. So for example, in group one, we're performing an inner join between the expressions in groups two and three. All right, any questions here? All right, so um, to form exploration, we are basically gonna be iterating through each of the groups and seeing if there's any exploration rules that match. So the first rule that matches is generate index scans. And this basically uh, allows us to create an alternate scan in which we're scanning the secondary index as opposed to the primary index. So remember we have the secondary index on column B. So um, this rule causes us to create a scan on, on that index. The next rule that matches is generate constrained scans, which basically means that we can actually push the filter down into the scan. So instead of performing a full table scan, we're only uh, performing a partial table scan um, starting from two and going forward because we have B greater than one. This is B is an integer. So, you know, starting from two and, and up. Uh, same rule matches on CD. We can um, scan the primary index since it's uh, keyed on C. Next, we have a reorder joins rule that matches. So we're basically just swapping the order. You can see that the, the groups two and three are swapped to be three and two in, in the second expression. Next, generate merge joins matches. Merge join uh, is basically when both inputs are sorted on the equality condition. We can just uh, perform it, you know, almost like a, a merge sort where we, you know, only need to scan each table once and, and that's the complexity of the join. Um, and finally, we have another rule that matches generate lookup join, which, as I mentioned, this is like index nested loops join where we're iterating through one side and looking up into the index of the other side. So kind of like a hash join where the hash table is already built. And there's actually even more expressions that we can generate in the first group, but I think you get the idea by now. Um, and as it turns out, after we uh, cost all these different expressions, the best plan is gonna to be to perform a merge join with these two constraint scans here. So that's the plan that's gonna get passed on to the next phase. Um, and, I'll, and I'll show you how the costing works actually a little bit later, but that is the exploration phase. Any questions? So uh, is your cost model like, so the Snowflake guys last week talked about in their cost model that they, they don't run analyze. Uh, are you running, like, do you support like analyze, like online statistics collection or are you relying on, like, I mean, I guess they're, they're more, I guess, olap stuff. So like they're getting bulk loads. You guys have to maintain these stats all the time. Like yeah. how, I guess, I guess my question is how good, how, do, how good do you think your cost model actually is? And obviously it depends on how often you run analyze, but like, is there any magic to that side? Like, are you using sketches instead of histograms? Are you using, uh, some of the more, more fancy data structures to do uh, summarizations, or is it just sort of textbook, like histogram stuff? Yeah, I'm going to talk about all that in a second. Um, okay, awesome. Sorry. We, we do um, you, you some do of that. All. <laughs> okay. yeah. all, right. all right, so the, the last phase um, is disequal planning. And this is actually not really part of the optimizer. It, it kind of happens after the optimizer is done. And it basically takes the, the plan from the optimizer, which as you saw, was basically you know, designed for a single node to execute. This merge join and scans are sort of just you know, single node operations. And it uh, extends them to whatever the uh, cluster topology is. So you can see that the DSQL planner will figure out that we need to scan CD on nodes one and three, and we need to scan the secondary index on um, AB on node two. Um, now, this is obviously something that we, we want to move into the optimizer at some point. There's 
plenty of op uh, opportunities for optimization here. Right now, it's sort of like a, a heuristic planner just for disequal planning. Um, but you know, for example, something that we could do is instead of just shuffling both tables here, like you can see with all of these lines crisscrossing, where we're basically shuffling both tables by hash, we could instead maybe broadcast one table if we knew that it was smaller or um, you know, take advantage of uh, how the tables are already laid out on disk. So that's something that we're hoping to do relatively soon. All right, um, choosing a plan. So this is going back to, to what you were asking about, Andy. Um, you know, I mentioned that we have all these different factors that affect the cost, hardware, data distribution, type of operators, and number of rows processed. So we're currently not doing a lot with information about the hardware configuration or data distribution. And this kind of relates to us wanting to bring more of the disequal planning into the optimizer. Because right now, we only use the uh, fact of data distribution in a few very select cases, which I'm going to show you in a sec. But we're, uh, in the next release, that's actually a big push that we're, we're going to try to make the optimizer more aware of data distribution. Type of operators matters, obviously. It's going to be a lot more expensive to perform a scan than a select, because the scan may have disk I.O., whereas a select is just going to be a CPU operation. Uh, but the way we deal with this is basically just assume that the relative cost is not going to change a whole lot between different queries. So we've we basically performed a number of micro benchmarks to try to um, understand the relative cost of different operators, and we have those parameters hard-coded into our cost model. Obviously something that we also might want to improve in the future, but it's, it's working okay for, for the time being. Um, so this last thing, number of rows processed by each operator, that is going to, of course, change query to query and depending on the data in the database, and so that's what I'll, I'll talk about next. So to find the number of rows processed, of course, we use statistics. And we collect the following stats on each table. We collect the row count. For each column, we collect the distinct count and null count. Um, and you were asking about sketches, and we use hyperlog log to calculate the distinct count. Uh, the null count is basically an exact count. And then for some columns, we also collect a histogram, which uh, we basically just do sampling to, to collect the histogram. And we use these stats to estimate how they change as the data flows through the execution plan to estimate how many rows each individual operator are going to process. So you, you said you collect histograms for some columns. Obviously, text columns, you don't want histograms are useless. But what are the other distinguishing factors that decide whether you want a histogram or not? So at the moment, we are just collecting them on index columns. Okay. Actually, we, you know, we're constantly changing things. So I, I realize we are. As of this coming release, we're collecting histograms on all columns, but for most columns, we only collect basically a two-bucket histogram, which basically corresponds to the maximum and minimum values. Okay. Uh, we collect bigger histograms with like 200 buckets for index columns, since that's sort of a hint from the user that those are, are going to be columns that are likely to be used in um, query predicates. OK, awesome, thanks. Yeah. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm going to talk about this in a little bit, but we currently only collect histograms on, on individual single columns, but hoping to expand that to multi-columns. Um, all right, so let's look at how we collect stats or how we calculate stats for our sample query from the last section. So uh, suppose we have this data about tables A, B, and C, D. This is, again, collected offline, which I'll talk about how we do that in a second. But suppose we know that uh, a, B, and C to each have 4,000 rows, and we have these histograms on columns B and C. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of weird looking histograms. This is my attempt to show what a equi-depth histogram looks like. Um, equi-depth histograms are a little bit better suited to graphization than equi-width histograms. So uh, the way we propagate these stats up the tree is we basically will realize that um, you know, for group three, we're applying the filter C is greater than one to our table CD. So we can uh, basically just cut off everything below that in the histogram and use that to estimate the number of rows, 1,500. And do the same thing on column B. We can estimate the number of rows as 500. And then finally, performing a join is sort of like an intersection of those histograms, more or less, not, not exactly. But uh, with this, we can determine that we have five, 500 rows. So 
Um, hopefully this gives you a sense of how we calculate how many rows are processed by each operator. And then we apply our cost model you know, with all of our relative costs for, for different operators in order to figure out an actual cost for, for each of these expressions. Uh, and then the, the last thing I'll say about stats is um, multi-column stats. We, uh, in addition to collecting stats on individual columns, we also collect uh, stats on multiple columns. So this is useful for cases where columns are co correlated. For, for example, if we have a predicate uh, where state equals Illinois and city equals Chicago, you know, the, the way we would normally estimate the selectivity of this predicate would be to just multiply, you know, calculate the individual selectivities and then multiply them together, assuming independence, which obviously is a very bad assumption for this particular case. So, you know, we'd say state equals Illinois has selectivity one over 50 and city equals Chicago. Say our database has a thousand cities, it would be, you know, one over a thousand. Multiplying them together is going to give us selectivity that's way too small. Um, so ideally, multi-column stats would help, help us fix this problem. Uh, but the problem is, how do you know which, which uh, sets of stats to collect? If you think about it, the, uh, the power set of possible columns is you know, exponential. Um, so again, we kind of take advantage of the indexes as a hint for what types of predicates we're likely to see in different, um, different queries. So in addition to the individual columns ABC, we also collect multi-column stats on index prefixes because all indexes in Congress GB are ordered or clustered indexes. Um, so therefore you can use the index as long as a prefix of the columns are constrained. So we collect multi-column stats on the set AB as well as ABC. And currently we're only collecting distinct and null counts, although hopefully multi-column histograms will be coming soon. All right, um, any questions there before I move on? Uh, hi, this is Lin. Uh, uh, Rebecca, so I have a question that um, when you collect the multi-column stats, uh, so maybe, maybe I missed this in, in, your, in your slide, but what if you are performing a drawing on two tables, right? You have a drawing predicate on two columns on two tables. Do you, how do you calculate the stats there? Are you going to collect multi-column stats across tables? That's a great question. Yeah, right now we're only collecting multi-column stats um, on a per table basis. So, you know, those kinds of join conditions are notoriously difficult to calculate. And, I, you know, I think right now we're probably way underestimating the selectivity of, of those types of join conditions. So in that case, that would just be a multiplication, I assume. Exactly, yeah. Uh, yeah, and another small question is how often do you update those stats? Do you run analyze or like, do you have some incremental online algorithm to update it? Or? Yeah, that's what I'm going to talk about next. So okay, good, cool, good, uh, good lead in. So, so yeah, so we have this command create statistics, which um, can either be run automatically or run manually. So you can, as a user, just run create statistics uh, S from table T. This is, uh, we also support analyze T, which is just syntactic sugar for create statistics. It's, you know, the same syntax as Postgres. Uh, and what that does is it basically triggers a full table scan of whatever table you're collecting stats on. Um, and here I'm showing the disequal plan for the stats collection. So the, all these table readers are, are basically scans of the table um, spread out across the five nodes that we have here. Then we perform sampling in uh, the following step where we collect a 10,000 size sample, 10,000 rows. Um, and we also, you know, insert each row into our hyperlog log sketch to calculate distinct counts for each column. Um, then these samples are aggregated and finally returned um, and stored in, in a system table that stores the stats. So we also run this command automatically and we collect stats automatically whenever a table is created, a new column or index is added because, you know, we want to also collect columns on we want to collect stats on that column and take advantage of the index to, you know, either create histograms or multi-column stats. And we also want to collect stats when approximately 20% of the data in a table has changed so that, you know, it's not, it, the stats never get too stale. So some challenges with this is, first of all, how do we even know when 20% of the data has changed? And maybe this seems kind of obvious, but it's actually not when you think about the fact that PackersDB is distributed, and you can have updates on multiple nodes happening at once, you know, lots of unrelated updates, 
And we want to avoid having a centralized counter that could be a source of contention. So this is one challenge. We also want to make sure that we minimize performance impact because this is running in the background when we have production workloads happening in the foreground. And we want to make sure that we don't impact those workloads. So um, how do we know when 20% of the data has changed? So we actually use a statistical approach. And basically, each node can kind of operate independently. So um, after a mutation on that node, we have a kind of a thread that's constantly running in the background. And the mutation will, will tell that thread that you know, I updated some rows. And the thread will basically kind of roll a dice and um, based on, on this formula, potentially trigger a stats update. So the formula is the number of rows updated insert, or deleted divided by number of rows in table times 0.2. So that's how we get 20%. Um, and on average, the table is going to be refreshed after 20% of the rows have changed. Although, you know, it's obviously statistics. There, there may be some outliers. So to avoid any problems, we'll always refresh if there are no stats yet or if it's been a while since the last refresh. And to minimize performance impact, um, you know, as I said, there's going to be many updates per second, and each node is kind of operating independently. Each create stats run is going to take on the order of minutes because we, we throttle it, as I'll talk about in a second. Uh, so if each node was just kind of triggering stats updates um, whenever it wanted to, we could potentially have multiple stats runs happening at once. Um, full table scan can impact performance. But many table scans at once can actually bring down a cluster. So and <laughs> hopefully the, the execution team is working on, on fixing that problem, but it's something that, that we want to avoid. So how do, we, how do we avoid this? Well, what we do is we run this create statistics command as a job. And we have a jobs framework that's used for long running types of operations like backup, restore, import, export, schema changes, and so on. So we take advantage of that infrastructure because it allows us to guarantee that there's only one stats job running at a time across the entire cluster. And it's also resilient to node failure. So if whichever node is managing the create statistics run, if that dies, another node can then adopt the job. And then even with all of this assurance that we're only running at most one stats job at a time, that can still impact uh, our production workload. So we throttle the stats collection to limit speed utilization um, to avoid overloading the cluster. And this is adaptive. So if, if we detect that the CPU is mostly idle, then you know, we'll use more CPU for stats. If it's already being used by another workload, we'll, we'll uh, tamp it down and you know, insert additional sleeps, basically, in, into our scan of the table. All right, any questions about stats? Go, I, I, I keep going, we're good. Cool. All right, um, how are we doing on time? You have 20 minutes, you have plenty of time. Oh, okay, great. So, you know, I, I've said a few times that we're not as aware about the locality as we would like to be. That's something we want to improve since, you know, geodistribution is obviously a kind of key differentiating factor of Cockroach DB. Um, but, you know, we do take it into account in, in a couple of places, which is important because network latencies and throughput um, are important in geo-distributed setups. And the way we take this into account is customers can optionally duplicate, uh, read mostly data in each locality. So if they have a table that is updated very infrequently and is likely to be referenced from multiple different regions, um, we suggest that they actually create a copy and store it in each region. And at the moment, this is kind of manual on the part of the user. We're working on making that more uh, transparent. But at the moment, the way this works is, let me go to the next slide. Uh, say you have this table postal codes. This is one of these kind of read mostly tables that is going to be updated very infrequently and may be accessed from anywhere. So what we do is we, we have the primary index, which has ID and code, and then we create two secondary indexes that are identical to the primary index. So, you know, they're keyed on the ID and they store the column code. And then we can pin each of these three different indexes in each of the three different localities. And then the optimizer will basically know to choose whichever index is closest to the gateway node where the query originated from. Um, so, and, you know, we 
have that in our cost model where all things being otherwise equal, we're choosing between identical indexes, we'll pick whichever index is closer. So, you know, this gets complicated if you say add a column and forget to update your other indexes or you add a region and you forget to move when an index is there. So this is something that we're working on improving. And uh, that's going to be kind of a new concept called global tables, which are going to have fast read access in uh, basically every locality and slower write access. Uh, we're also working on supporting geopartition unique indexes. So this is kind of another important feature to uh, improve our multi-region offering. Basically, you know, if you think about the way we would support a unique constraint today in a, in a single region, you would just have a, a single unique index on whatever attribute you wanted to uh, have a unique constraint on. But that gets complicated when you try to partition by region because then it's, you can't ensure just with the index that the value is unique. So we're adding some extra functionality there. I also mentioned that we're working on moving some of the disequal planning to the optimizer and just generally incorporating latency more into the cost model. So lots of work to do here, but it's exciting, exciting stuff. All right, um, and then to finish off, I thought I would spend a little bit of time talking about theory versus practice. I, when I left grad school, I think I had a concept of what query optimization was, which you know, wasn't totally wrong, but I think the emphasis turns out to be a little bit different, especially when you're working with an OLTP database. So when we first created version one of the optimizer, remember we already had a heuristic planner before that. So we wanted to make sure that all of the workloads that were running really well with the heuristic planner didn't suddenly have a huge regression once we turn on the optimizer. And you know, because even though the heuristic planner obviously has a lot of problems, it's really fast. So we spent a lot of time trying to minimize overhead for simple OSP queries. You know, these are like the primary key lookups and updates where you really don't need a lot of optimization. And in order to do that, we took advantage of logical properties, which are actually essential for all parts of optimization. So these are things like cardinality, which is, which is different from stats. Cardinality is basically uh, you know, things that we can statically prove about a particular operator in terms of what its maximum and minimum number of rows are. So for example, if you have a limit, say limit one, the maximum number of rows output by that operator is one. Uh, similarly, if you have a predicate that has a contradiction, um, we can just kind of constant fold that to false and that'll return zero rows. Last week um, in the uh, Snowflake talk, they were talking about how they could kind of take advantage of their stats, which, which were always perfectly accurate to perform these types of um, optimizations. Our stats are not 100% accurate, but there are certain things that we can statically prove that we can take advantage of. Functional dependencies are important. Things like you know, the key of a table always functionally determines all of the remaining columns. Um, figuring out which columns are, are never null is important, and the, the list goes on from there. Another thing with an OLTP system in particular is that uh, normalization rules are really important. So we have, as of today, I checked 242 normalization rules and only 29 expo exploration rules. And you know, part of the reason is that every exploration rule is going to increase, potentially increase the size of the search space, which is going to slow down planning time. Normalization rules, uh, you know, since they never keep around the old versions, are you know, always generally good to have. And then lastly, I, I never realized this, but you can actually get a benefit by optimizing things like foreign key checks and cascades. So if you think about it, a foreign key check is something like you insert a row into a child table, and you need to check that a particular column you know, the, the column with the foreign key reference actually has a value in the parent table. And we do that by creating a join between the two tables. And, you know, joins can be optimized. We can choose a particular join algorithm or a particular index. So we spent a lot of time actually pulling all of that code that was previously on the execution side into the optimizer. So, to be clear, so, so like, I insert into the, parent, the child table. Mm -hmm. And then you run a select query that's a join against the child table and the, the parent table on the key you just inserted? Yeah, exactly. So this is 
after the query is run, but before like the transaction is over, we yeah. have the concept of a post query. And if, you know, you can either say, depending on what the type of check is, if it returns any rows, that's going to cause an error. Or if it doesn't return rows, that's also going to cause an error, you know, depending on, on what we're checking. Oh, so you, so you do it at, at commit time, not on the critical path of the query that did the insert. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. Or, you know, if, if it's, if it's part of a multi-statement transaction, I think we still do it uh, after the specific statement. We don't wait all the way until commit time, but okay. that's something we, we could consider doing in the future. I'm thinking, yeah, actually, yeah, it makes sense. It, it, right. It, Cause it, if it's an update, you don't know, it's not like insert, you know, what you just put in the update, you know, if you just modified it, you don't know what, what happened. Okay, okay, makes sense. <laughs> cool. All right. Um, all right, so join ordering is kind of the classic, you know, holy grail of query optimization. I think everybody rightly assumes it's one of the most important problems and it receives the most attention, but believe it or not, we almost shipped V1 of our optimizer without any join reordering whatsoever. Uh, in the end, we did actually implement two um, exploration rules, commute join and associate join, which basically just, you know, implement those, you know, the commutative relationship and associative relationship between joins. So this is actually really inefficient, but it was a good way to kind of, you know, fast and dirty get some join reordering into our first version of the optimizer. And because it's so inefficient, we limited it to uh, at most four tables by default. You could change that if you wanted more, but um, it would increase the planning time. So this summer, actually, we, we had a, an awesome intern that um, fixed our trying reordering to use the, oh, what happened? I lost my screen. Sorry. Uh, fixed, Zoom, Zoom refreshes my screen too. It's annoying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, so he implemented um, DP sub E from this uh, Sigma 2013 paper you see here. And it basically, as it says, performs a you know, correct and complete enumeration of the core search base. So it enumerates basically all of the plans you might want to consider, kind of excluding plans with a lot of cross joins, uh, but you know, it enumerates bushy plans and all that. And it's a lot more efficient than what we had before, so now we order up to eight tables by default. If you have a query with 12 tables, we'll basically just reorder the subtree of eight tables. So I just point out that the, the first author of that paper, that's, the, the, first of all, they're Germans, but that's, that's Thomas Neumann's, that's his advisor. Cool. And there, there's yeah, a book this, he's the book he's writing on query optimization. Awesome. Is it? I think this might be the algorithm that Hyper uses, or or some. Pro, uh, no, Hyper doesn't use this. is This is Cascades, right? Well, it's uh, so it's it's a dynamic programming algorithm. It's basically one. You know, we're still doing Cascades, but as part of this join reordering, we sort of, you know, almost like pull the the tree out and create a Hyper graph. Yeah. And, I. Okay, then I, th I think this is this is twenty sixteen or what year is this? Twenty eleven. Twenty thirteen. But I, th I think there are other. I think there's a newer one from Hyper that that is a build on top of this. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So another another important thing is query cache, which I think doesn't get talked about a lot. We have an LRU cache keyed on the SQL string, and it stores the optimized memo. And for prepared statements with placeholders, it stores a normalized version of the memo. So then to actually execute the prepared, prepared statement, basically replace the placeholders in the normalized memo, and then perform additional normalization and exploration. So we can take advantage of, of some optimization up front, and then we perform the rest after replacing the placeholders. Uh, another thing that's important is optimizer hints, because you know, the optimizer is not always going to choose the correct plan. So you might want to be able to just hint to the optimizer, you know, use this specific index, for example. We have an at index name syntax that allows you to do that. And you can also hint a particular join algorithm. So, you know, inner hash join if you want to force a hash join or a similar for merge and lookup. And this also allows you to hint a particular join order because as soon as you hint an algorithm, we're not going to bother changing the join order. So, Cockers, you guys try to support the process dialect, but I don't like this is definitely like these hints are awesome. I like this syntax, but I don't think Postgres supports this kind of stuff. Yeah, no, th this is not um, from Postgres. This is, this is specific to you guys. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, this is good. I like this. Cool. Yeah, I think we, we had somebody who um, did a project where they were actually 
you know, telling the optimizer which plan to create by giving it different hints and then, you know, doing some kind of learning optimization based on that. I, I don't know, something, something cool like that. But, uh, all right, another important thing is debugging tools because even with, you know, all of these tools, our customers still occasionally say, you know, why is my query slow? And we have to figure out why. So the customer runs um, explain, analyze, debug, or you know, there's also a, something they can click in, in the UI. And it generates this bundle that we get, which has basically everything we need in order to recreate the query. It has the, the JSON with all the stats, has the, the schema, the environment variables, um, various levels of verbosity of the plan, as well as the original statement. Um, and with this, we can basically recreate the plan and, and try to figure out what's going on. So that is all I had. Um, final note, we are hiring. So definitely come talk to me or check out our careers page. We're also open source and we're always accepting contributions. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Awesome. This is fantastic. So I'll, I'll applaud on behalf of everyone else. Uh, so uh, I've asked a lot of questions, so we can open the floor up uh, to anybody else that wants to ask questions. Otherwise, I'll, I'll just keep going. Um, may I ask? Like, two, hey, two I mean, yeah, you know, they ask. Just go for it. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks a lot for the very interesting talk, Rebecca. So I actually have uh, two questions here. The first is um, I'm curious about the the query cache. You said you only cache the memo, and do, then you will do the normalization and the exploration again, right? But mm -hmm. is it true for every query? It's like even for a simple OLTP query, you'll still do all the normalization and exploration again. Um. Yes, that that's true. Um, so I, you know, I, sorry, what, what were you gonna say? No, I was just gonna say. I mean, OLTP query itself may just run. I don't know, like milliseconds, right, or sub milliseconds. So if you are going to do the normalization and exploration again for all the OLTP query, that sounds a bit more, right? Yeah. So the problem is that. Um, there's certain types of optimizations that we can't really do until we have the specific value for the placeholder, like um, constraining the index, for example. I, and actually, that, that is something that we talked about doing in the past, like basically just kind of assuming a default value for the placeholder and, and creating, you know, and constraining the index so that we have a fully normalized plan that, you wow. know, say a customer could just, say, set a cluster setting so that it's always just going to use the default plan and not right. bother re-optimizing for the prepared statements. Um, right. Yeah, that's definitely something that we've considered. And you know, if, if there's enough demand for it, we might, we might actually do it. Yeah. I see, I see. Yeah, and another question I have is, um, you, you said you, you want to um, bring in the optimization for the, the distributed query into the optimizer. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, at what stage do you mean that? Do, do, do you think the distributed like the data distribution information would affect normalization? Probably not, right? Would that affect exploration? Or is like a, after normalization exploration, uh, you think that's probably should be the place to, to add in the optimization for the distributed query? Yeah, a great question. Um, I think probably it would make the most sense at the exploration phase because you know that's when we might say explore different variations on join algorithms like I was talking about instead of just you know always doing this kind of shuffling by hash value, you know, we could do a broadcast join or, uh, you know, some sort of kind of a range partitioning, something along those lines. Uh, yeah, and you know, it's also going to come into play in, in the cost model, obviously, which doesn't, which doesn't get used until the exploration phase. So, you know, we're, we're not, even, even once we bring in the disequal planning into the optimizer, we're not going to actually perform a full disequal planning at, at that stage, you know, things like very specific, uh, you know, node identifiers and things like that, you know, might not be that useful in the optimizer. We might just care more about, you know, which regions do we have and, you know, the specific nodes we can, we can leave until uh, after optimization. So that's, you know, something that we still need to work out, but. Right, makes sense, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. All right, anybody else, anybody else have any, any other questions for Becca? Okay, well, let me go. Uh, how do you guys test this thing? So how do you like make sure that like, one, you don't have any regressions, but that like your cost model is, uh, you know, correctly guiding the search to optimal plans? Like how do you, like, and, the, and, and, the, and that the cost model is correctly identifying that one plan 
it, you know, the cost model says this plan is better than this other plan, and then when you run it, it, that's actually true or not. So like the Orca paper, for example, talk about this thing, Taco, where they're running these things all the time. They, they pick the best plan and the second best plan and prove that it actually, uh, that, that the ordering is correct. Like what kind of automation do you guys have set up with, for, your, for your infrastructure? Yeah, good question. Um, so we don't have a lot in the way of proving that the plan that's chosen is the best plan. Um, I think that's something that we probably will want to add in the future. I mean, the most of it's about proving correctness. Uh, so we, we have this kind of data-driven testing framework, which is, which is really nice. Basically, we you know, have a whole bunch of query. I, I think it, it's similar to maybe what the SQLite testing does, where you, know, you have a whole bunch of queries, and it out, outputs the, uh, the, res, the expected results. Um, we also do that with the query plans. You know, we can expect certain query plans. But that's, that's, that's like testing like correctness of the plan generated. Right. Like, I'm, like this is more like the, how do I test? Like is the cost model, like is the cost model guiding the search correctly to the optimal plan in some ways? Right, so right. Um, yeah, you know, we, we have some tests that we used to basically tune the cost model. You know, like I was talking about the uh, relative cost of the different operators. Um, I'm trying to think if there's something that we kind of run on a more continual basis. I don't know if there's any cockroach yeah. people on, on the line. Feel free to jump in if you can think of anything. <laughs> That's okay. Um, and then uh, for, that, for that little bundle thing of like for the debug bundle, again, not to, there is an Orca person here on the call, and that's why was, like, they, they were messing with me. So I apologize for sending up to everyone. Um, the, you know, Orca made a big, big made, talks about how like, oh, because I know, you know, our database system is not running in the cloud, it's running on customers, customer sites. So therefore, if there's a problem with the the, the query optimizer, like the, we get you you get back a debug bundle, mm -hmm. and in your case, it looks like you're getting all the input parameters for the for the actual that was used for the query. And is that enough to debug everything you need, or would would you like to have some other functionality that you guys currently aren't shipping? Um, right now, that's enough to debug everything we need. Um, okay. Once we start adding more to the cost model to you know make it more aware of the cluster topology and how the data is, is laid out, then you know we're probably going to need to collect more information than that. But okay. um, as okay. of right now, we can exactly reproduce the plan. Um, to answer your previous question, though, I was, I was just kind of thinking in the background. Uh, you know, we do run standard benchmarks like yep. TPCH, TPCC, and you know we can kind of track the fact that. Since we added this improved join reordering, for example, over the summer, our TPCH results are much better than they were before. So, you know, and we, we make sure that pl certain plans don't regress. Like, you know, we, we say we know this is a particularly, this particular plan is good. And if we see that it's changing, we try to figure out why. And, uh, you know, presume do you, guys, do you guys run a, a, a SQL fuzzer? Like something like SQL Smith? Yeah, 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 we have, we have SQL Smith. So, okay. but, you know, that, that is more kind of, just catching errors, like if, if it's going to cause an internal error or crash or something like that. Sure, yeah, yeah. Testing correctness. But, um, but yeah, actually, uh, Manuel Rigger, uh, he's the guy that was doing more kind of it's logical. Answer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he, he did a bunch of experiments with CockroachDB, and he, he opened a bunch of GitHub issues for us, which is, which is pretty great. SQL Lancer is awesome, yeah. I'm yeah. trying to, get it, trying to get, get it running in our system. Um, all right, so then my, the... In general, what like what's the complexity of the queries that you're seeing? And I, I understand that like that might be sort of self-selecting because like Cockroach DB is not primarily like a like a snowflake vertica data warehouse. So therefore the kind of queries people might be running on it, like the complexity might be limited because they might push back to like something like, you know, like a snowflake. Like would you say you're seeing at the level of like TPCH, that's very common, or even like TPCDS, or are you seeing things that are more complex? Um, that's a good question. You know, we have some telemetry. We have, so you know, we now have these two products. We have an on-prem database product and a cloud product. Uh, with the on-prem clusters, um, you know, by default, it will send us telemetry information, but customers can turn that off. So you know, sure. we're we're never sure exactly if we're we're getting everything. Uh, I think with cloud, it's just we collect tele telemetry on everything. So you know, as that business grows, you'll we'll get more information. Uh, you know, for, for example, 
we collect a telemetry on the maximum depth of the join tree. Yes. And the vast majority are, you know, one, two, three tables, and then it just kind of exponentially decreases. We, you know, we've def we've seen people run fourteen way joins on Cockroach DB, but okay, it's very uncommon, I would say. So I, I mean, this is a useless metric, like the the number of tables. But I felt like there was for a while when I would talk about like different different vendors, like, oh, you know, what does your query optimizer do? And for whatever reason, they would always boast on the number of tables they can join. Like MemSQL was like 75, Splice Machine was 135, and the HANA guys were like one or 1,200 or whatever their number was. Like, I, again, you're, what you're describing to me is what I think is more realistic, that like most people are running like three table joins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, exactly, which is why, you know, we were kind of okay with having our, our suboptimal join ordering algorithm for a while and, you yes. know, our, our new algorithm is much better, but it still is defaulting to reordering at most eight tables, so. Okay, all right, so the last question I'll ask, uh, and if, if anybody else has any questions, please interrupt. Um, I'm gonna ask you a variation of the question I normally ask other people, uh, is how stupid are your users? Um, and, but, I, but I'm specifically asking about in terms of the, those normalization of rules you run, like not, not X or one equals two, like, you obviously want to have them because they show up, but like how common are those sort of like, uh, like double negatives or, or like the clearly, you know, always evaluate to false. And yeah. So typically those types of rules are going to be more useful for, um, for example, ORMs will generate really weird queries. Um, and also our own normalization rules when, when they fire, they might produce some weird, you know, construct yep, yep. that we then want to further normalize away. Yeah. So, yeah, I, w I wouldn't say our, our users are writing these bizarre queries. It's, it's more just the kind of automation right. that creates them. Um, actually, the last question, too, is like, are there any, um, is there any like uh, restrictions on those uh, rewrite rules in terms of the complexity that they're allowed to, like, like you mentioned, like, oh, I can invoke a function that's in Go. Mm -hmm. Is there any, like, how do you inform, how do you make sure that, like, that function doesn't compute pi or some crazy shit like that? But, like, you know what I mean? Like, because I can imagine a scenario where you maybe want to go look in the catalog and get some additional metadata that could help you do the constant folding or some, some, some other, uh, or some other rewriting, but that might be an expensive call in, in, in the environment. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think we're sort of just relying on the fact that, you know, these are not, uh, user-defined functions. We don't allow users to just create yeah. this code. This is all, you know, either written by us or written by, you know, contributors who, you know, we're going to review that code. Yes. Um, but, but yeah, that's, that's a good point. There's probably a risk of something like that happening. Okay. All right. The last question, I, I guess, it's, it's, it's an easy question. CockroachDB is hiring. How important is, if someone wants to join the query optimization team, like, are you, first of all, are you guys hiring in that space? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think the optimizer is the team that's hurting the most right now for people. I, I think okay. we could oh, definitely you, we could definitely, definitely use we could definitely use somebody. There's only three full time engineers on the optimizer team right now, um, but there's only two full time engineers on the SQL execution team right now, and you know okay. other teams that are understaffed. So we we need people everywhere. <laughs> But no, no, I always say in the class, Becca, you're ruining for me. I always say, like, if you hire, if you do query optimization, uh, I can get you a job tomorrow. Like, like if someone comes in and is a student that's really good at query optimization, you would hire them, right? Uh, yeah, probably. There we go. That's all I wanted. Okay, <laughs> awesome. All right, and Becca. For sure, we're, we're, you know, hiring interns as well, so. Okay, awesome. All right, Becca, thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us. Uh, I'm glad you're safe and, and healthy in uh, Chicago. And this, this was awesome. This, this talk was exactly what I was looking for. So again, awesome. thank, thank you, Becca, for, for being with us.